So we're going to be talking in this class about uh, dynamics on networks, uh, primarily thinking about biological applications, although there certainly are other places that you can use these kinds of techniques. It's a relatively elementary class. Um, it's a project-based class, and I'll go over some of that. Uh, historically, this has been a mix of people from different departments, uh, different uh, seniorities have had everything from sophomores to uh, to advanced graduate students take it. And uh, it's meant to be fun. So today we're going to try to, we probably won't cover everything that I was hoping to, but we'll try. Um, we're going to talk about what networks are, uh, a little bit about kinds of networks. We're going to talk specifically about biological networks, because the theme of the course is uh, modeling biological networks. And we'll go over a little bit about course logistics. People who've been in this, my classes know I try to understand a little bit about what modeling is. So you've heard some of that before. And then we'll do a little bit of a in-class exercise. This class tends to be uh, a bit of lecture, a little bit of computer exercises on your laptop. So I ask people to bring their laptops uh, with you. And then uh, we'll see how far we get. We may or may not get to the computer exercises this week. They're pretty easy. So the first question we're going to ask is essentially, what can we model with network dynamics? And then uh, what? how do we build network dynamics models? And then later on in the course, we're going to do a little bit of mathematics, not a lot, uh, on uh, how we analyze network behaviors, uh, predict their behaviors. And then uh, we probably will talk a little bit about biochemical, biological uh, chemical synthesis networks, signaling networks, and uh, uh, gene regulatory networks. And this kind of class always needs a little bit of a lot of things. I like to say you need a Wikipedia level knowledge of a bunch of different things. You need to know a little bit of biology, a little bit of mathematics, a little bit of computing, uh, but not a huge amount of any of them. And almost nobody comes to the class unless they've done this before, uh, knowing all of the things that are needed. So don't be shy about that. Historically, we've had people take the class from uh, psychology and brain science, uh, uh, computer science, uh, informatics, uh, ISE, biology, physics, mathematics. And so uh, people try to sort of complement each other and fill in gaps. So we'll start out just by talking about what are networks. Well, there are all sorts of networks. I mean, we're talking, of course, I'm having trouble connecting here to a network of a particular kind of computing network. Uh, but networks really are a, a way of uh, organizing our understanding of uh, how certain kinds of things work in the real world or in the virtual world. And a lot of the real world can be understood in terms of network concepts. Uh, the course is going to focus on biological networks, but most of these concepts and methods apply in other contexts as well. And so if we want to try to think about networks, this is a very old slide. Um, it's really an old slide. Uh, uh, you can think about uh, network abstractions of various kinds. Um, if you work with Kati Berner, she'd have uh, citation networks, uh, scientific article cites another scientific article that cites another scientific article that cites another scientific article. Um, classically, there was a lot of work done on protein interaction networks. This protein binds to this other protein, which binds to this other protein, that binds to this other protein. Of course, the internet is classical network. Uh, you have links. Uh, connecting nodes uh, with servers. And at the top, we have a picture of a very old picture of uh, United Airlines route map, uh, which is an airline network. And so one of the things we want to think about is we use the word network to describe all of these things. What do we mean by a network? Um, here are some other networks. This is uh, on the bottom left is a map of a variety of diseases and uh, their relationship as described uh, in the scientific literature, how clustered they are. 
Uh, at the top right, we have an economic network. It represents uh, trade between different countries throughout the world. Uh, at the bottom is uh, evolutionary tree, because trees are also a kind of network that represents our understanding of the phylogenetic relationships between organisms. So we can think of evolution as also building networks of a particular kind. Something that's always relevant at the beginning of the year uh, is uh, infection networks. Uh, here we have a picture of a person who had the flu. They came into class, they coughed on somebody, they gave everybody else in the class flu. Those people went to other classes and coughed on other people and infected other people. Uh, and you have a network of, uh, of influenza cases. Maybe these days it should have been COVID cases, but flu is also still uh, relevant. Uh, at the top, we have a picture of, a uh, very old picture of uh, neurons and their interconnections in a brain, dead brain, a fixed tissue brain, uh, trying to show some of the architecture. And of course, uh, these days, machine learning and neural networks uh, are a very powerful abstraction that's used a lot. The bottom is an RNA silencing network and a biochemical network inside of cells. Um, all of these networks have, there are a lot of differences. Maybe the differences are more salient than the similarities between these networks. Um, when we talk about biological networks, uh, there are a number of types of network that we will run into frequently. Uh, chemical reaction and metabolic networks are the networks that uh, process energy and build the components of cells, uh, primarily in the mitochondria in uh, every cell in your body. If you didn't have those metabolic networks, the cells would die. And mitochondrial failure is one of the ways cells die. Uh, they also generate the energy that keeps your cells going. Signaling networks are uh, networks that mainly convey information from outside cells to the inside of the cell. So the cell does something in reaction to something happening outside of it. Uh, regulatory networks are networks that turn genes on and off in a cell, and particularly associated with uh, differentiation or de-differentiation during development or uh, diseases like cancer. But these are, are the three classic uh, biochemical networks uh, that the network biologists work on. And if, you're, if your background is in bioinformatics uh, or you've done high throughput uh, gene sequencing or omics, uh, those are the components of those networks are what those uh, experimental methods study and those computational methods study. Another network that's going on inside your body all the time is a transport network and has a sort of an awkward name, uh, physiologically based pharmacokinetic networks or PVPK models. And this is something that models uh, essentially the flow of blood in your body and how chemicals are absorbed uh, in your gut, for example, uh, distributed through the blood. Uh, metabolized or eliminated and uh, and then excreted in the urine or the feces, some in the sweat, some in uh, breathing, but mainly in the urine and the feces. Uh, that seems rather different from these other things, but if you take a pill uh, for a disease, you need to know uh, how long the molecules in that pill take to get uh, into your bloodstream. Uh, how much of that molecular species gets into various tissues because you want it to get the places it needs to go and not elsewhere, uh, and uh, how long it lasts. Those can all be things that are calculated. And as I was saying before we started, that's actually a topic of great uh, current interest in industry uh, because the FDA now requires that kind of study for every new drug that is released. Uh, and so, uh, there's an enormous demand on the part of companies like Lilly and uh, AstraZeneca for people who know how to do that. There are other kinds of biological networks. One that you run into uh, with disease, but also with uh, uh, tissues are what are called population dynamics models. Uh, if I look, for example, at the uh, uh, 
colonic crypts inside the, my intestines, what I'll find is that the, if you've ever eaten tripe, you know the tripe is composed of a honeycomb. Your intestines are composed of a honeycomb of cells. Uh, those cells have a particular organization of uh, crypts. They're little indentations. At the bottom of the crypt are, are a group of stem cells that reproduce. Uh, above them uh, are cells that uh, are what are called transient amplifying cells that are partially differentiated. Uh, at the top, there are cells that uh, are fully differentiated um, that do things like secrete the particular molecules or absorb molecules in the gut. Um, and those in turn uh, eventually die and, and are sloughed off because the gut's a harsh environment. So the cells only live about two weeks in the gut. And so uh, the spatial structure there is very important. Uh, but there are plenty of models of the proliferation of the stem cells and how it's different, how they're regulated, their differentiation, uh, and their death. And so those are called population dynamics models. Of, those could be populations of cells, could be populations of viruses uh, or bacteria in an infection, could be population of animals in an ecosystem. Uh, if you're a toxicologist and... Uh, I know Ibrahim uh, online is, is uh, doing some toxicology. Uh, there's also a concept of what is called an adverse outcome pathway. And a pathway is a kind of network. Uh, you're exposed to a particular chemical. That chemical causes a problem in a particular cell. Uh, that problem then propagates through the tissue uh, and causes some systemic outcome. And so, uh, Toxicologists often use uh, network models to try to predict uh, the connection between a molecular cause and a systemic effect. So as I said, to be able to understand how networks work in the context of biology, uh, we're going to use a little bit of a lot of things in biology, biochemistry, certainly bioengineering, a little biophysics, uh, classical chemistry, definitely uh, some computer science, a little bit of data science, not much here. Uh, dynamical systems and, and mathematics more generally, a little bit of statistics. Again, uh, none of this is at a very high level, uh, but uh, you, this is typical of a, this is a mixed, I don't know what maybe I should have asked to begin with. I, I know at least one person's an undergrad. What fraction of the people in the room are undergrads? Okay, so three, so it's a mix. So, so uh, if you are an undergraduate and you've never taken a, a, a nominally graduate course, uh, graduate courses are not in general more uh, difficult than undergraduate courses. They do give you a little bit more freedom. And so one, one has to be a bit, maybe a little more self-motivated in, in a course of this kind. Uh, but the expectation is that, that you'll do, we have a textbook this semester. It's a, a simple textbook, but a nice one. Uh, but the, the expectation is that you'll, you'll go out and fill in gaps when you find them. Uh, and if there's a problem identifying ways of filling them in, uh, please do reach out to me. I'm happy to help out. Um, this course is nominally in, in engineering, uh, in intelligent systems engineering, although early versions of this I taught in the physics department for many years. Uh, and in the math department. Uh, but uh, why is it an engineering course? And you can ask the question that what's the difference between science and engineering generally? And there are a lot of ways to answer that. But in a sense, science is really trying to de derive or discover uh, abstract descriptions or principles to predict the behavior of systems. Uh, and Engineering really tries to take that knowledge and control systems or design new systems. Uh, and this class is going to be somewhere in between the two. Uh, during the class, really we'll be doing more discovery. It'll be more scientific, but these methods are used extensively in engineering. And definitely it's possible to take these ideas and make them much more uh, engineering focused. So, uh, Biologically, generally, what we want to do, of course, is be able to understand how biological processes result in the things that we see, which are pretty complicated. Uh, 
Uh, we'd like to be able to predict things that haven't been seen before, uh, predict rather than post-dict things. We'd like to be able to understand mechanisms. And we'll certainly talk about some of those mechanisms in this class. Uh, Herbert's textbook does a little bit of that, but it's it uh, those the discussion of really network mechanisms in detail tends to get put into more advanced uh, textbooks. We can definitely come back to those if people are interested. We'd like to be able to design experiments. I don't know if anybody here today, this year is a wet lab biologist, uh, but certainly these kinds of methods can be used to decide what experiments to do or how to interpret uh, wet lab experiments. Uh, computer simulations are cheap uh, compared to say working with animals. Uh, and so uh, if you could use computers to help you uh, narrow down the experiments you need to do or make them more effective, that's uh, quite valuable. Again, as engineers, and I do think of myself as a bioengineer, um, we have to be able to predict what our interventions are going to do. Uh, in particular, uh, if we change some set of inputs, uh, we need to know how the outputs of our network will change or the relationships in our network will change. We'd like to not only be able to predict it, but design interventions. There's some outcome we want. We'd like to be able to know how to get that. That's design. And, and I don't know how much design we'll be able to do in the lecture part of this course, but it's a project course. So people are interested in that, something people can work on. Um, examples would be finding new drugs to treat particular illnesses, uh, optimizing drug dosing schedules, or that this is something that came up a lot uh, during the COVID where we had, there were new drugs like uh, remdesivir or, um, a Paxlovid, how often do you give them? How long do you have to take them for? Uh, any drug you take has some toxicity. Uh, this is even more true, for example, of uh, chemotherapeutic, the classical uh, cytotoxic chemotherapeutic. Uh, chemotherapies work by killing cells that divide. Well, cancer cells divide a lot, but a lot of other cells in your body divide too. So chemotherapies are, tend to be exceedingly toxic. If you gave people enough of a chemotherapeutic, it would kill the, all the cancer cells, but it would kill all their other cells too. And so you have uh, constraints on what's possible in things like delivery of medication. The transport, which I showed very briefly also comes up. Uh, in cancer, uh, the blood vessels uh, supplying tumors are, are not very well tumors are not very well plumbed. And so a lot of a tumor is not exposed to high levels of a drug that's uh, delivered through the bloodstream. That makes it a problem. Um, and so if we have some desired set of output behaviors, we really wanna be able to design some kind of uh, inputs that will give us the outcome we want. Um, and that's not so easy to do. And so those are the things that we hope to begin to think about in a course like this. This is, again, in principle, the beginning of a sequence of courses. I teach a more advanced course in the spring. Vikram Jadao teaches a course in molecular dynamics, uh, which is also on design more at the molecular level. Um, and so these, these courses are, are not uh, replacements of each other, but they're all different aspects of thinking about this kind of problem. So the class officially uh, meets every, just Tuesdays, uh, 4.10. I hope we'll be starting at 4.10, if we can get the, the computer glitches working, uh, till 7.10 every uh, Tuesday. Uh, there's this textbook, Herbert Sauer's uh, Systems Biology and Production to Pathway Modeling, uh, a nice elementary textbook. Uh, it's inexpensive. Uh, Herbert's available if you have questions at the University of Washington, Seattle. Uh, you want to ask him what's going on. Have problems with the software, we can get help. So there are good things there. Uh, there are, uh, Herbert has some other textbooks uh, that are a little bit more advanced, which we can look at. Uh, and there are plenty of other textbooks. There's Uri Alon's textbook that I particularly like. Uh, Eberhard Voigt, a first course of systems biology as well. Um, all of them take a slightly different perspective. Um, all of them have some nice examples. And if people have particular uh, examples they'd like to see worked through in this class, uh, we can do that. I'm hoping uh, later in the semester, 
that we'll have some classes where we take a paper or a, pro, uh, a, a model uh, and work on it as teams together in the classroom, analyze it together, process it together, build the simulations, run them and, and explore. And the reason the class is structured as this sort of three hour block is because uh, with the exception of the first couple of weeks where there's gonna be a lot of lecturing, I think of this as sort of a mix between lecture and lab. Uh, so I do, I do hope that people will bring uh, their laptops with you so that you'll be able to do some computing in the classroom. Uh, I'll try to put things up on Canvas, but I, I find Canvas a little bit clunky. And so I prefer to use a Google Drive folder. If you're not, if you're registered for the class, you will have gotten emails with all those links. If you're not registered, send me an email and I'll get you added to the roster so that you have access to all of that material. Um, there is no uh, exam. I don't like writing exams. I hated taking exams when I was a student. Uh, I don't like writing exams. I do not like grading exams. Uh, I don't find exams very helpful. I think they're stressful and usually not uh, very useful. Uh, the flip side of not having exams is you need to be a little bit disciplined about keeping up with things. Some, the one, one thing exams do is motivate people to do the, to, to read the text. Uh, so there'll be homeworks, uh, not every week, but mostly every week. Um, those homeworks are going to be rather open-ended sometimes. And so at the beginning of every homework, it'll say, you know, spend a reasonable amount of time on this. And if it's taking too much time, well, you won't get a perfect score on the homework. Say, say it just took too much time. Uh, it's okay. Uh, your grade, is, your grade is not. This is not a course that's graded. Uh, the goal is to have everybody learn. It's not. It's not meant to be a harsh class. Uh, the main thing in this class is there's a mini project. Uh, I encourage people to work in teams. Uh, two people, three people. I wouldn't say more than three. Uh, you're welcome to work alone, but that's a little bit more effort. Depends a bit on people's interests. If there are complementary backgrounds, then it's always good to connect people. If you have experimental wet lab biologist who doesn't have much mathematical background, you have a pure mathematician who's never looked at biology, that's a good team. Uh, and uh, you'll do a little oral presentation at the end of the class of your project. Um, you get some po just points for showing up and asking questions. Uh, if you, I don't, no, if anybody has anybody does anybody here not know Python? Is there is there anybody who's never used Python? One person. So we will use very little Python in this class, but you do need to know basic Python. Uh, and uh, we'll cover the basic Python that you need in the class, but it's still better off doing a little bit of work on your own. Uh, the level of of knowledge you need is not great, but you need some. And so if you if you do, there's an online tutorial in, by a group called Rosalind that I think is very good for teaching basic uh, Python. Code Academy has modules as well. Um, we have a, we just finished our two week uh, summer course. And we start out that always with a one day intensive Python bootcamp. You could watch the videos for that if you like. Uh, and so for people who come in with without the Python, I give an you know, extra few points if you actually complete it, show me your badges for that. Um, and then I do ask people to uh, upload their project. People do projects and they, they disappear. Uh, and uh, we, 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 you'll have the option of using an online uh, server system called NanoHub. People have taken this class classes with me before will have Maybe some complaints about NanoHub, but uh, it does have the advantage. You don't have to download anything to your computer. It's purely uh, uh, browser-based uh, interface. Uh, and I will ask people to distribute their projects on NanoHub. You get a DOI, so it counts as a non-reviewed, but nevertheless counts as a publication. And that way it, you have something from your project that you could put on your CV and point to a potential employer. And actually people have over the years, somewhat to my surprise, have gotten some reasonably good jobs based on little projects they did in these classes. So uh, the goal 
is to try to not waste your time. Um, I do ask that people try to get homeworks and things in on time. Uh, so there's a bit of a of a implied threat that if things are late, there could be consequences. Please do bring your laptops to class. Um, we'll be using a software called Tellurium. Oh, that will be getting into that a little bit later in the day. Um, you can download it or you can use the NanoHub install. We'll go over the NanoHub install uh, in a few minutes. Uh, if you do download it, I recommend using the Jupyter Notebook version of it. There's an older spider version that uh, is okay too. Uh, and we'll be doing everything in Tellurium in class. That doesn't mean you can't use other software, but that's the software we're gonna be covering here. There's also a very nice uh, online database of uh, published models using these uh, tools uh, run out of the UK, uh, the EBI in uh, Cambridge in, in the United Kingdom. Uh, and they have uh, thousands of, of published models uh, using these techniques. So if you want to learn what can you do with these kinds of things, that's a great place to look. The guy, the guy who runs that project is a good friend. And uh, maybe we can get him later in the semester to show up and talk to us a little bit about that database. It's quite an interesting one. Uh, reading. Um, again, Herbert's uh, textbook, I think, is a good place to start. Um, there are decent Wikipedia articles on network theory, network science, dynamic network analysis. Um, the next day or two, we're gonna be focusing on chapter one in Herbert's uh, systems biology textbook. And uh, Tellurium has really good online documentation. Uh, Tellurium.readthedocs.io uh, has a tremendous tutorial that covers almost everything you would possibly want to do with it. And basically everything that we'll have in the class is in that, is in that, that online documentation. So I do recommend that. So people who've taken a class with me have seen this slide a lot. Uh, the first term that we have to define is we'll talk a lot about models. And, and surprisingly, the term model is one that can be a source of confusion to people. Um, a model is something that takes a set of inputs and makes a prediction of something that is meaningful. And in general, meaningful means that there is some way, at least in principle, of making experimental measurement that would either confirm or deny what you predicted. Um, you'll see that there are two arrows going into model, one called para input parameters and one called model structure. And the difference between parameter values and the architecture or plan of a model uh, is particularly uh, clear in something like a network model. Um, we're going to see an, um, a network architecture. What is the structure of the network? What connects to what? Which will be a model structure. And then there are going to be parameters that say things like how fast do things occur? How much of something do we have? You, certainly a function is a kind of model. Uh, this is a more general structure perhaps than a classic function. Typically a function is a, is a, is a state, is, is, a, uh, is stateless, right? You have a set of input values and the function returns a set of output values. Um, there is no internal state within the, within the function. Now, of course, you can, you can generalize that. Um, but uh, I think frankly, like for example, a feed forward network uh, would tip, could be thought of as a function, a very complex function. Uh, whereas a recurrent neural network would typically not be thought of as a function because it has internal state. But I would agree with you that there's a lot of there are a lot of terms that you could use that that overlap each other. Okay. Models are are fundamentally abstractions, and one of the things that's difficult, especially when you're dealing with something like biology in the real world, is that you have to make very harsh assumptions. You're making enormous oversimplifications of very complex underlying reality. And there's a principle which we don't really adhere to in this class, uh, which is that models should be as simple as possible 
uh, to accomplish a particular task. And especially in the literature of infectious diseases, uh, people like Alan Perlson uh, work with very uh, strong uh, mathematical criteria to say, can we include something or not? Uh, there are, if you, if you look in Wikipedia, there'll be a lot of discussion about uh, what are called AI, the AIC, which is a, a set of criteria for determining whether you should add complexity to a model or not. As engineers, we tend to be more pragmatic. If we know that something is important in the real world, we tend to include it in our uh, computational representation of it, even if it doesn't wind up being important at the moment. Um, but it's certainly true that uh, deciding what to leave out of our world is going to be as important as deciding what to include. And I realize that these all are going to seem very abstract at the moment. And one of the problems I face always giving this class and any class in modeling, it's a little bit like learning any language. Um, when you learn a language, there's always a question of, do you learn grammar first? Or do you learn vocabulary first? Do you learn conversation first? You can't really talk unless you have some words to talk with. Uh, you can't really talk unless you have some sense of how to put the words together into a structure. Uh, on the other hand, my presentation is a linear thing. I have to start somewhere. And so uh, essentially what we're talking about here is grammar, which can seem a bit dry and abstract, uh, but I don't wanna go into too much detail about the grammar, but I, I want people to have enough orientation of the structure of what we're talking about that when we go in and start digging into what we're really gonna do with it, it makes sense. And so then we can circle back and talk about the grammar again as you learn to speak because the whole point of this is to develop a language, the ability to converse, because building models and using them is a kind of speaking, it's a kind of language. And so we're learning a foreign language here, or maybe for some people, not a foreign language, if you've done this before. Uh, but fundamentally, it's learning a language. And part of that is the computing language, but again, that's more like the vocabulary and the grammar. And really what I want people to learn from this course is how to speak freely, how to write essays, so to speak, how to write, how to, how to apply the language that we're gonna develop. We're gonna find that the, that the actual computing language we're gonna learn has about five elements of syntax. It's very, very simple. Um, and yet what you can do with it is quite powerful. So let's talk about networks, generically in networks. Uh, a network is a graphical model and a network has two components, two basic kinds of objects. It has nodes, which are dots in this picture, uh, and they're connected by links. So there's an idea that you have a node and there's some influence or interaction, and that interaction is defined by a line. Now what those uh, nodes represent and what those links represent will vary depending on the problem whether all of those things are present at the same time or playing out at different times will vary from between the problems. Uh, whether the links are bi-directional or unidirectional will depend on the problem. Whether the architecture is a tree or totally connected graph also will depend. The architecture here, that's the plan network structure is something that's very specific to networks. We have nodes connected by links, and that gives us a structure, a topology. In general, uh, we have no, the nodes can be <coughs> connected to an arbitrary number of links. Um, often links only connect two nodes. Uh, but in biochemistry, you can have uh, multiply connected things. You can have three chemicals come together to make two different product chemicals. And so you can have uh, more complex links. That actually makes de developing uh, graphical user interfaces to write biochemistry rather challenging because if you have, you, know, you have to have all the permutations, you know, seven inputs and three outputs. And, and so you're doing GUIs is a pain. So for the people who are online, Elmer asks, when I say topology, how seriously do I mean topology in a, in a mathematical sense? And, and uh, mathematically, when I say topology, I really mean topology. Um, that is the identity of connections matters. 
but the particular uh, geometry doesn't. So if I took that network and stretched it in one direction or the other, as long as A is connected to B all the time, it's the same network. So the spatial, the spatial embodiment of that network as I put it in a display doesn't matter. Now, now, I'm not saying that you couldn't build networks which have some relation to spatial organization, but that's not an intrinsic feature of a network. And so one of the things that you'll get is that displaying certain kinds of networks and highly connected networks like molecular interactions. Almost every molecule interacts with almost every other molecule in a cell if you put them in contact. Um, and so you get what are called hairballs where you have you know, molecule A has 50 links and molecule B has 50 links and molecule C has 50 links. There's no way to embed that and display it in, a, in an effective way. Uh, people like Cotty Berner spend a lot of their time trying to come up with graphical ways of representing networks that make sense to our brains. Uh, but uh, in general, it's not so easy to, to take a complex network and put it on a two-dimensional piece of paper in a way that makes sense. The networks we're going to work with in this particular class will tend to be pretty simple ones, which we can draw. Uh, but uh, things like biochemical reaction networks, the Krebs cycle, is a mess. It's really complicated. Um, and so, um, again, we're going to be leaving out a lot of complexity when we represent that biological systems as networks. Um, and one of the things that we're going to face, uh, I don't have, Joelle is not here this year, but when we, when we try to build networks, we're going to find out that um, in reality, uh, the world doesn't come with network labels. And so in biological systems, uh, we're going to have to try to infer what networks are. And that's not always easy to do. We're not going to focus on that in this class. In fact, a lot of bioinformatics is trying to infer what the network structures are. Um, but this is, this is a difference of direction. As engineers, we typically start with a blueprint and then we see what it's gonna do. Uh, in science, we don't have the blueprint. We have to back, we have to reverse engineer the blueprint. We have to infer the blueprint. And so that again is sort of this dichotomy between a scientific approach and an engineering approach. Okay. Um, Elmer brought up the question about the relationship between networks and real spatial world, world the real world. Um, the nodes could be things that are totally abstract, like uh, scientific citations in a database. Um, or they could be real entities that don't have a spatial uh, structure, like uh, the fact that oxygen and hydrogen react to form water. Uh, or they could be things that really do exist in space, like that diagram I showed you of the United Airlines uh, route map, where the nodes are cities, or at least airports in cities, uh, and so they are embedded in space. Um, but even when the nodes represent things that exist in space, um, the network itself doesn't embody space. Um, we might have a concept that the node, that a link between two nodes has a distance associated with it, uh, but there is a, the space by itself isn't really a core component of networks. Um, it is possible uh, to build net, networks that that emulate space, and and we do this uh, in a sense that you don't tend to think about it this this way as a network. But if we're going to do something like solve, uh, numerically solve a, uh, a partial differential equation, we typically will have an array which contains the values of the of the of the PDE of the of the field that we're solving the PDE for. And suppose that, there, that we imagine that array existing in three two dimensional space or three dimensional space, we'll have a two dimensional or three dimensional array. Each element of that array is got an address i j k and it's next to i plus one comma j comma k it's next to i comma j plus one comma k and so on so we could think of links between neighboring elements of an array and so we can certainly build maps that convert spatial relationships into networks and vice versa 
Um, but the point there is that the spatial relationships are embodied essentially in the presence or absence of links. Again, that's a little bit abstract, and, and I wouldn't have gone into so much detail except that Elmer asked about it. Um, there are other ways of thinking about networks. Uh, by default, a, net, a node in a network doesn't have structure, it's just a point. Uh, but you can imagine networks with inside of networks. Uh, here, it, it's a little bit too small probably to see, but in this uh, picture, uh, the lower of the two pictures, uh, we have a, a, one of these PBPK models. It's of the blood flow in your body and how it distributes uh, chemicals uh, through your organs. Um, each one of those organs can be opened up and we could have a network describing the biochemistry occurring in your liver, the biochemistry occurring in your kidneys, biochemistry occurring in your lungs. And so in that case, we'd have a node and inside that node, there would be another network. So that would be a hierarchical network. Uh, the kind of spatial network that, that Elmer was asking about um, these days gets to be used a fair amount also in drugs, which is if I take a pill, uh, in a classic pharmacokinetic model, my intestines, my whole gut is one big box with no spatial structure. But in fact, that pill gets transported down my throat into my stomach. Uh, it dissolves and gradually goes into my intestines and eventually is eliminated. Um, each little zone from throat to stomach to gut has its own properties. It has pH, temperature, salinity, ability to absorb and secrete things. And so I could take my gut, unwind it into a straight line, build what are called compartments, and say this compartment does this, this compartment does this, this compartment does this, and then I can have an arrow that says, well, my gut, the peristalsis in my gut transports chemicals from here to here to here to here at a particular rate. And so that's taking a, a spatial structure and mapping it onto a network structure. So I can make, make these structures quite uh, spatially detailed if I want to. Okay. Classically, the nodes represent the things that you're modeling. Chemicals, cities, airplanes, species, individuals. Um, and the nodes always, always have a state that is a list of the properties and values of those properties. What are the parameters associated with the node? What are the variables associated with the node? Um, it could be something trivial like this is O'Hare Airport, just a label, uh, or it could be the concentration of chemical X, or it could be how many people of each age and income and gender do I have in a city? So the, the state that lives on a node could be something very simple or something very complex. Again, except in these kinds of hierarchical networks, typically we don't put an internal structure into a node. If we're chemists, that's called a stirred reactor model. We have links between nodes. Uh, those links define relationships. Uh, in a dynamic network model, which is what we're going to be focusing on in this class, uh, those links represent interactions. Uh, an interaction changes some aspect of the node state. So the state in one node affects how the state in another node changes. Um, if that is directional, um, then we typically represent uh, the interaction with an arrow. Um, something does something to something else, that doesn't mean it's reciprocal. If the re interaction is reciprocal, then we use a double-headed arrow. And there are a lot of different kinds of arrows that we can draw. Uh, we'll deal basically with three in this class. Um, and there's a little bit of non-standardization of notation that we have to come back to. Um, interactions usually or often take the form of uh, either transformation um, if I am moving material from one place to another, 
or I'm turning a chemical from one chemical to another through a chemical reaction. That's a transformation or transport. Um, but uh, it doesn't have to be. It could be flow of information as well. Okay. And so uh, while almost every field, uh, engineering, scientific, or otherwise, has a concept of networks, and uses diagrams like these network diagrams to describe those concepts, um, those conventions in the, are different. And so you have to be aware that when you read the literature, the same idea may be represented with different, different images. Um, somewhat surprisingly, for example, economics, traditionally, the nodes actually represented interactions and the links represented states. Trust the economists to, to flip things. Uh, uh, but in, in biology, in most of the world, it goes the other way. So well, this is a very general concept. In fact, it's such a general concept, it may seem like it's not even worth talking about. Uh, but over the years, I found that if we don't clarify these concepts at the beginning, it get, you can get tangled up later. Um, uh, so when we're going to define a network, we have to define what are the number and categories of the nodes? Um, what are their states? Do they have any substructure? How many and what kinds of links do I have? Are they directed, undirected, bidirectional? Are they limited to connections between nodes of specific categories? Um, something that we'll get in biology a lot is the concept of a, of a regulatory link. And regulatory links point from nodes to links. So that's a different kind of a link. Here, what we call the modifier would be that. And so we'll, we'll have some, some graphical notation to, to adjust to. So um, maybe we should just take a few minutes here to, um, to think about this. And I'll let people do, do this for a few minutes, maybe five minutes. Um, First, I'll do this to get with you. We'll do the, the, the airplane example, and then I'll ask people to do it on their own. Um, I want you to think about some situation and uh, build. think about what it means as a network. Uh, what is the thing you're trying to represent? Uh, that could be a real world thing but, or something abstract. Um, how could you use a network model of it? Because if you don't have some application for it, it's not really worth building the network. Uh, and then what would a node be? Uh, what would the state of a node be? What would a link be? And if we're going to do it for two different cases, how would the two cases be different? So let's talk about this example together. Um, here's my ancient scan of a United Airlines in-flight magazine. And you can really tell the date because it has Cleveland as a hub and it doesn't have Newark as a hub. So, so I, well, maybe Newark, Denver, San Francisco. All right, no, Houston. So it's after the merger of, of United and Continental, but before they shut down their Cleveland hub. So uh, dates it to something like 30, 25 years ago, this picture. Okay, so what, anybody want to give me an, a, a, a guess? And there really aren't right or wrong answers. What does this network model abstract? What is it a, a picture of? It's not a trick question. A lot of times I'll, I'll ask questions that there seem to, the answers are so obvious, people will think that I'm trying to trick them, but it's not a trick question. It's just a, a very basic question. What does this represent? What does this network model represent? Right, flights between airports. In this case, the United Airlines flights between airports. Um, and and what's a little bit confusing about it, perhaps, is that they've they've labeled their hubs, the named hubs here, uh, but there are a lot of hard to see dots, which are all the cities that they fly to. 
And so fundamentally, this is a list of the routes, probably in principle, the nonstop routes that United Airlines flew back in 1990 something or other. So Elmer says, how could we categorize the nodes or the links in, in this particular example? So let's let's get let's we'll get to that question in a minute. So that's you're ahead of us, Elmer. And I'll repeat the questions from the room because there are people online. So I want to make sure everybody hears. Okay, so I guess the next question you might ask before we get to the question of what do these represent is what could you use this model for? But people used to really enjoy looking at, at, at route maps. Where does my where does the airline fly to? How many connections do I have to go fly to get from Fargo, North Dakota to Paris? Uh, um, which uh, hub might I connect through? These kinds of questions. Maybe a little bit spatially, how long would it take to get there? But clearly the lines are not geodesic lines. They're just, just drawn to not overlap as much. We talked about hairballs, the fact that it's not easy to put these things in a, embed these things in a two-dimensional picture very well. So yeah, I could say, if I wanna get from one city to another, where, how many stops do I have to make? Or what stops could I make? Or maybe what parts of the country uh, does United have a lot of service in or not have service in? It could be a possibility. There, there, there are others, I'm sure. And now Elmer's question. So what does a node represent? City or an airport in the city, you know. Uh, specifically an airport that has United Airlines service because there are other airports that don't. If I wanted to have a net, an airport, a, 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 if I go to a, a, a website like Flight Tracker, it'll show me a lot more airports because it, it's not the United Airlines site. It'll show me all the airports in the United States or at least all the airports with commercial service. Um, what are the nodes internal states? That's a little bit of a trick question here. To make this to make this model useful, you probably have to add more to the internal states than we have here. Um, for example, rain. Well, but well, so those could be things that are added. But if we just look at this picture here on the on the on the map. Right. Yeah, as, as Elmer and you said, I mean, it doesn't, there's basically the only thing we know is we have a bunch of small dots that are unlabeled that may be hard to see in the projector, which are cities that are not United Hubs. And um, we have a couple of labeled cities which are named, which are hubs. So we know more essentially, is it a hub or not? And if, and for some of them, we have a name. So the amount of internal information we have is quite limited from this diagram. Um, now, if we wanted to actually use this diagram for something, we might want to add information to this network. And this is why there's this the dichotomy between model structure, which could look very similar, and uh, what we do with it. What are the parameters and, and variables that are associated with it? Um, we might want to know, for example, how many airplanes do we have on the ground at each location at any given time? We could impose that on this, right? The state of each airport could include how many 747s? Well, they don't use 747s anymore, but they did in those days. Uh, how many uh, 737s? How many, uh, how many uh, Embraers are there at each location? How many passengers are there at each location? How big is the airport? Those are all uh, pieces of information that could be attached to these nodes, depending on what we want to do with the network. That would be a generalization of this simple picture that we have on the on the piece of paper, uh, depending on what we want to do. I'm sure you can think of other examples too. What do the links represent? Well, we already said the links represent nonstop flights uh, in the United Airlines system. Um, 
But if we wanted to use this network to actually do something, we might want to be able to know, for example, how long does the flight take? Um, what's the probability of delays at any given location in the node? Um, we might need to know what the size of the planes were flying on each link, because that'll give us a sense of how much carrying capacity we have on each link, how many flights per day we have on each link. And so again, we can think of all sorts of additional information that we might want to use, depending on the application that we're going to uh, employ this network for. So now, having done that, we'll come back to this little exercise. And I'd like people to uh, not take more than five or 10, let's say it's people 10 minutes. And we can, we can have people, if you need to take a break, we can do that also during this time. But um, pick two networks, get just a piece of paper out. You can type it on a computer if you want. And there'll be a homework assignment, which will be to work this up. So don't worry about making it very specific. Um, pick two things that are of interest to you, maybe biological ones, they don't have to be. Um, they could be some of the examples I showed of networks before or something of interest to you. Um, uh, and, and try to answer those very briefly. So one sentence, what are, the, what, are the, what are you trying to abstract? What is the network a picture of? Uh, what would you potentially use it for? Uh, what do the nodes represent? What information lives at the node? What's the node state? What do the links represent? And if you have time and you've done two, if you only do one, that's okay. But if you have time and you've thought about two of them, how are they different? In other words, if you pick the, please don't pick the airline network. And if you pick two, don't pick, you know, the United Airline Network and the Delta Airline Network. Uh, although, Comparing United and Delta actually can be interesting because you could say, would I prefer to fly United or Delta between place A and place B? Well, that's something you could use a picture like this for. Right? So why don't people take 10 minutes to, uh, uh, to uh, think that one through? Let's, let's think about this. Have people had a chance to think about an example? Does one or two people want to give me an example? Okay, so let me repeat that. This was Pedro's idea was that one network could be could be uh, professors at a university uh, would be the nodes and the links would be collaborations. And one of the state elements might be how much funding there is for the given collaboration or and you could and the topics of the the research of the various professors. And that you could use this to try to look for collaboration opportunities or funding opportunities. It's a perfectly, perfectly reasonable thing to do. Many universities do try to do that uh, formally or informally. So that's a good one. Anybody else have one that they'd like to, to suggest? So how do you suggest that, that a predator prey network would be a good example of this in an ecosystem where you have uh, the nodes represent populations of predators or populations of prey and the arrows would rep the links would represent predation, um, and that's absolutely a classic uh, network. Uh, and and uh, it's different in a sense from the the network that that Pedro suggested because uh, the collaboration network essentially is undirected. Collaboration is bidirectional, whereas predation is usually directional. Um, and so uh, both of them potentially have a time element in, involved in them. Uh, in one case, the node might have a single individual as the node, uh, although you could imagine the node in Pedro's case being a group of researchers in the professor's group. Um, and so uh, you know, predation network, the ecosystem network is a classic example of that, of the population. That's why I wanted to include that population biology example in, in my list of, of network types. That's great. Thank you, Harry. Elmer suggests, uh, the network of states of a cell during differentiation, going from a stem cell uh, to more differentiated cell types to more differentiated cell types. Um, certainly, uh, in that case, uh, one of the links would essentially be transport, would be the interconversion of cell type A to cell type B. 
uh, you might have both in that and also in the population model, a link that goes from a, a node to itself, which could represent, for example, the replication of the individuals. Um, you could have a node that goes from a node to nothing, which would represent the death of the individuals. So you could have different kinds of links that would be associated with that. Um, so those are those are great examples. Right, so the, the suggestion was you could have nodes of individuals and then the links could represent many different kinds of relationships. Um, marriage, friendship, uh, telling somebody about some uh, internet meme uh, and so on. Uh, so some of those might be directional networks, some might be some links, might, some might be bidirectional, um, some might be in time, some might not. Uh, so I guess in that kind of question, the, the trick would be to define what, what are the node, the, not so much the node classes, although the states of the nodes would be important, but the link classes. Uh, in, in a lot of systems, there are a lot of different kinds of nodes and relatively number, limited number of links types. Uh, in the example you give, there are potentially an almost limitless number of relationships between individuals. And so you could have a lot of different link categories uh, in that case. Yeah. Right, so the, the suggestion was a phylogenetic tree. Well, I, I showed a phylogenetic tree and, and one of the, the and they, there the, the node would be a species and the, the link would be phylogenetic relationship. One of the things that's always a little tricky about that particular one, it's a very seductive idea, but, but in fact, the definition of species is a rather fuzzy concept. Uh, and the state of a species is always changing. And if you're dealing with things like bacteria or viruses, uh, it's not even clear that the, that the, the species isn't really even a, a well-defined concept uh, at that point. Um, and so um, each one of these raises all sorts of really interesting questions about how do you abstract? Because ultimately when we're gonna build a computational model, an object either exists or it doesn't exist. Uh, in reality, we have fuzziness, especially in biology, or, but also in social interaction. There's fuzziness. Our membership of a category may not be a one or a zero, but in the computation, either the variable's there or it's not. Labels are, 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 are either there or not. And so, so uh, when we build a network model, we wind up having to, uh, Disambiguate is not a very pretty term, but it, but disambiguate or or or, or uh, subdivide things that might, in reality, be be more graded. And so that's a, it's an important point that you make that I think we have to be aware of the limitations of this kind of modeling. Uh, frankly, when when we start building models of this kind uh, for biology, I'm always amazed that they believe anything predictive at all, because the assumptions that we make are so harsh. And the uh, the simplifications are so radical uh, that that it's it seems to me almost miraculous that they work. They don't always work, of course. They fail, uh, uh, and sometimes very simple models. I mean, the the SIR model of infection, uh, of, of viral infection, which everybody liked to play with back at the beginning of the COVID period, um, radical simplification, and yet. Uh, relatively simple generalizations of SIR models predicted uh, epidemiology pretty well, pretty well over, over extended periods of time. Uh, a lot of people over the years have done, have done infectious disease models for projects. Maybe people are tired of that now. Elmer asks, how much flexibility do we have in fuzzing out a network? And ultimately, the, the idea of a network, if you don't have well-defined nodes and links, you don't have a network. It's not a network model. On the other hand, you have almost complete freedom to define as many variables or parameters living on a link or a no, I mean on a node as you want. And so if the node is, then a variable could be, Suppose, suppose a node is, is the number of individuals of a given species at that location in, in, in a population. 
that would be you have a node for lions, a, load, a node for grasshoppers, a node for this. Um, but your nodes could be ecosystems where this node represents the swamp uh, next to something else, this represents the mountain. And then your variables would be the number of individuals of different species. And so you can, you can have a certain amount of fuzziness uh, in the sense that you could create lots of different variables living within a node, uh, and those could, variables could be continuously variable quantities. But nevertheless, you have to at some point make a decision about what those quantities are going to be. Um, and, and this is going to come up later on when you do what's called, when you do things like perturbation analysis, because uh, changing parameters is something that's relatively easy to do computationally. You change the numerical value of parameter K, that's easy. Changing node architecture by adding links or taking links out is not so easy um, computationally. Uh, some of these things are, are, are matters of, of uh, convenience. So for example, if I think of a neural network, um, just, just feed forward neural networks rather than recurrent ones. But if I look at feed forward neural networks in, in TensorFlow or, or PyTorch, it'll give me lots of different architectures. But ultimately, all of those are specializations of an all to all connection at each layer. And why don't I use an all to all connection and just say I've got a lot of zeros in it? Well, Suppose that I start out with an image that's a thousand by a thousand voxels, and I now want to have an all to all connection between a thousand voxels, a thousand by a thousand, so a million voxels to a million voxels. I now have 10 to the 12th links in each layer. And I can't, even on a good computer, I can't represent that. And so I have to make some simple, I can't put all those zeros. I can't build the array with all the zeros in it. Conceptually, the, 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 I can imagine the, 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 the set of all possible links and then set a lot of them to zero. Uh, but as a practical matter, it doesn't work. Um, now, if you're doing mathematics, sometimes it's very useful to think of that generalization. Um, and uh, I know one of the things that Randy Beer, who's of course a great network, one of the great network scientists here at IU, uh, has argued is that when you train networks, like a neural network, um, if you don't have something that forces values to zero, they drift off of zero. It's a neutral, neutral evolution. Um, and so then you get, you get these arrays that have non-zero values that aren't really doing anything. That's sort of a specialized case, but it's an interesting one if you're thinking about neural networks. Okay. So now we, let's talk a little bit about dynamics. Um, if you talk about network science, uh, and we have a network science institute here at IU, uh, NSF funded one, there are a lot of them, um, or, uh, or you look at the things that Kati Berner traditionally did, not so much now, um, there's a lot of interest in the topology and architecture networks. You know, who's connected to whom, uh, how many connections are there, uh, how long are they, and so on. Um, but in biology, normally, really, what we care about is how things change in time. Uh, if, if things don't change at all, uh, it's, it's, not, it's not really meaningful biologically. Um, and of course, if we want to be able to control things, we have to be able to change them. And so uh, in this class, at least, we're going to be focusing on dynamics, how things change in time. And there's a nice article uh, that I found online, uh, which which discriminates um, a, a number of different situations, which we 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 won't really focus on. Although some people in in this class over the years have, have worked on building things where the network architecture changes, um, but network dynamics can happen in two ways. Um, you can have a fixed topology, a fixed network architecture, and the states at the nodes change. And most uh, biochemical networks are of that kind. 
Um, now, if we have a gene regulatory network that turns genes on and off, we can imagine that the gene, we could do think of that in two ways. That's coming back to what we were talking about. You could either think about that the gene was there but turned off, so it had zero value, or you could think about the gene being a node that wasn't there that appears when you turn the gene on. Uh, those are points of view, but, but computationally, mathematically, they have rather different uh, effects. Um, so uh, we're going to be focusing on uh, what I call dynamics on networks, which is given a network architecture, uh, how do the values at its nodes change in time? Uh, dynamic network structure would be the kinds of things that were done in things like uh, um, um, small world networks and this kind of thing, where you do reinforcement of the network itself. You add links, so you take links out of the network. Um, in reality, both of these things occur. Uh, you can, to some extent, uh, trade them off against each other. Um, but um, we're going to be focusing on dynamics on networks here. Uh, network science people tend to be more interested in, in dynamics of networks. And, and in the case of, of biology, uh, both of these things occur a lot. Um, if we think about a, a cell, for example, as an agent, that cell has a set of networks inside of it, metabolic networks, signaling networks, and regulatory networks. There's also a network of what are the other cells that that cell is interacting with. Um, if the cells move, then the individuals that, I, are, that that cell is interacting with change in time. And so the network of interactions for the cell outside of the cell will change in time even if the network inside the cell is fixed. And so uh, if I'm an individual moving around in a city, um, the individuals that I will interact with will change. And so that uh, typically would be a, a situation where that's where the network example breaks, begins to break down a little bit. If the network is continually remodeling itself, then the network abstraction may not be that useful. Um, and so uh, one wants to think about those, but we're gonna be focusing in this class really on, uh, here's a network architecture, what does it do? Uh, not to say that we can't ask the question, uh, if we change the architecture, what happens? But that's a, that's a tends to be a slightly more challenging question to answer. Right, well, the, Elmer asked the question, well, if we change the weights of connections, uh, is that remodeling the network or not? And as, as I say, this is a, in a sense a matter of opinion. It's, you can imagine a network where every possible connection exists, but the weights are zero for most connections. Um, but that, that already uh, presupposes a certain amount of, of prior information and certain limitations. If, if I have a, a network where cells are born and die, or individuals are born and die, I can't a priori define every possible interaction because I don't know what the nodes are when I start. And so again, that's a case where the network abstraction just doesn't work very well. You can force you can force things into a network abstraction there, but it's just not a very it's not a very uh, productive way of thinking about the problem. But it's a good it's reasonable it's a good question to ask, and and I think. Uh, especially when you're dealing with with uh, agents and and their behaviors, um, the extent to which thinking of agent model based models as networks is is really it's a little bit problematic. Um, sometimes it's very helpful, but not always. So that's what we're going to focus. All right. So again, uh, coming back to nodes, so we're going to be focusing on networks where the, the network is given to us in some way, uh, we'll define the network. And then we're going to have some state on the nodes and we want to know how those change. Um, the amount or concentration of particular chemicals typically, the level of activity of particular genes, um, whether a person has the flu or not, um, number of airplanes at a given city, firing rate of a neuron, what the differentiation state of a cell is. 
what the population of rabbits is, which or and foxes at a given location. These could all be uh, state variables. And again, the, the links are going to represent interactions. And if I if I were going to be a bit more technical, uh, I would here I've written that the, the interactions specify how the node states change in time based on the states. Um, and technically, you should divide things into uh, processes, interactions, interaction processes, and dynamics. Um, here, we're going to finesse that particular division, um, although we'll come back to it later in the class. Okay. And so, again, the kinds of dynamics that we might want to know would be, what's the rate of firing of, of a given neuron under particular circumstances? Um, what is the number of individuals infected with influenza in a given city or a given location? Uh, what are the animal populations in an ecosystem? Uh, what's the concentration of uh, a drug in a different or in different organs as a function of time? And so uh, all of these are are examples where networks can be very useful. Um, they also are, for the most part, things that do exist in space. And so you might want to have a, a, a geometric model, a spatial model of this, a PDE model, a partial differential equation model of it, an agent-based model of it. Um, and so you have to ask the question, is it, is it useful to have that level of additional detail? OK. But again, coming back to just our bottom line, a uh, dynamic network has a set of nodes the nodes have states. There are links between the nodes that define how uh, the state of one node changes the state of another node in time. And then the rate of change of dynamics that says how those uh, interactions play out in time. And what's very valuable, what's very powerful about uh, these network models is that fundamentally the, the mathematical formulation of any network dynamics is the same. Uh, you're going to write a set of rate laws that say how things change in time, how states change in time. Uh, what those rate laws are and what they represent will change, but there always are going to be rate laws. And so uh, if you could learn how to write rate laws in one context, you can write them in another. So now let's come back uh, and actually start being a little bit more specific. Uh, Herbert comes out of uh, chemistry, biochemistry in particular, and so his textbook starts out really thinking about uh, chemical reactions and the, and the software that uh, we're going to use, the tellurium and antimony, were really designed to write chemical reactions. And so um, clearly without biochemistry, there wouldn't be life. So it's a reasonable thing to start with. Um, we, if you, I'm going to assume that people have never had a chemistry course. So probably people have had chemistry courses, but let's just start from the very beginning. So in a chemical reaction, we have something called a substrate, which is usually put on the left-hand side. And those are used up to produce a product on the right-hand side. And of course, uh, mass and atomic species have to be conserved in a chemical reaction. And so... Uh, the first one I've written down is two ADP uh, convert to an ATP uh, plus an AMP. If you're not a biologist, those molecular species may not really be very meaningful. Uh, ATP is, is the main energy currency that cells use. Um, the D, T, and M stand for, it's adenosine diphosphate, adenosine triphosphate, and adenosine monophosphate. And, and an awful lot of biology consists of moving phosphate groups around. Uh, really, we could say almost all biology consists of moving phosphate groups around. Uh, do a little bit more about them, a lot of it. Um, and you'll notice that those arrows are bidirectional. And that's actually going to be something we'll come back to because it's, it's not an intrinsic concept. Bidirectional arrows are a little problematic. But this representation of chemical reactions is something goes into turns into something else. It's used up to become something else. Is fundamental to everything we're going to write down in this class. 
And of course, Elmer and Pedro, who took the next semester, have seen this whole class represented in one lecture because we cover this material in, 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 in the spring as well in a very shortened form. Um, uh, but certainly, if it's a chemical reaction, we're going to have mass conservation. Um, much of the biological networks we're going to deal with don't conserve mass, but, but in chemical reaction it better conserve mass. And this, this formalism is going to allow us to write a lot of things, not just chemical reactions. Um, one of the things that we're going to have in chemical reactions that we always have to be aware of is, is what's called stoichiometry. Um, there are particular numbers of molecules that come together and produce particular numbers of molecules. In this case, two ADP produce one ATP and one AMP. That's for mass conservation and species conservation. In this case, the nodes represent molecular species and the state is either the amount of a molecule or the concentration of the molecule. And in general, in general, we are going to use the concentration uh, in the chemical reactions we're going to write, but the amounts are also reasonable. And the links here in a chemical reaction represent the transformation, chemical transformation, a chemical reaction. We consume the substrate, the input, and produce the product. And we're going to always use an arrow with a pointed head uh, to represent a transformation. Whenever we see an arrow with an arrow on it, a barbed arrow on it, that's going to represent the destruction of whatever species is on the source side of the arrow and the creation of the species on the on the target side. Um, any kind of arrow of that kind represents has has an associated rate of action. There's going, going to be some concept of a rate of chemical reaction, a rate of reaction associated with that. Um, in reality, uh, chemical reactions are a little bit more complicated than this because uh, we concentrations are an abstraction of, of molecules. Molecules are discrete. Uh, chemical concentration is a continuous variable, but reactions are discrete. In fact, of course, what happens is that chemical reactions occur when we have molecules collide with each other, and there's a little bit of magic about well, what orientation has to happen for molecules to react and, and so on, which tends to get finessed. Uh, and so, and if I were going to be teaching biophysics, then we'd talk about that a lot more. Biochemistry, we'd talk about it a little more. But let's just think about a very, very simple chemical reaction and how we might actually use, it's almost uh, embarrassing to call a chemical reaction a network, but it's going to be a component of a network. Uh, you look at you look at something like a metabolic network. It's got an awful lot of chemical reactions in it, but they're all built up in the same way. So here we have molecular species A and molecular species B uh, react to form molecular species C, and uh, we use up one molecule of A and one molecule of B to make one molecule of C. And we want to know how the uh, rate of production or, or the uh, of C depends on the amount or concentrations of A and B. And one of the things that we're going to have to learn, and we'll go over this in the context of different kinds of networks, um, is if we see a picture like that, what are the steps that we have to go through to turn that picture into something that can be solved and answer the question. And there always are going to be the same sorts of steps that we're going to have to go through. So the first thing is that uh, notationally, and sometimes Microsoft will change things to italics when they when I don't want it to. Uh, for example, when you take do you want to take uh, um, gradients and things, it always wants to put the nabla as an italic, which is an annoyance. So occasionally you will see an italic where it shouldn't. But in general, I will use uh, the Roman uh, form uh, A, B, and C to be the name of the chemical species. 
And the italicized letter will be the concentration or amount of that species. Okay, so that's, that's, uh, and I, I, I am sure that I will make mistakes on that, but that's the, that's the, the goal. And so we will call the concentration or amount of each molecular species named A, B, and C, A, B, and C in italics. Um, the second thing is that what we want to know is the rate. And so we have to assert that there is a rate. And people who've heard me in other classes know, uh, I, I will often say one of the things about building models is that nothing exists unless we assert it. So even the most obvious thing has to be stated. If we don't state it, it isn't there. Uh, in the real world, things exist, but in the model, unless we say it's there, it's not there. And so we say that the rate at which A and B combine to make C is a velocity, and it's called V sub F. The F stands for forward, because in principle, C could go backwards to make A and B again. And so there'll probably be a, B, a V reverse uh, later on. And then uh, chemistry is going to tell us what that rate is. Uh, if, if the rate comes from outside of the model, then the, the, the model doesn't really do anything for us, uh, except say how much of A and B we need to turn into C, to make a certain amount of C. Um, but under some particular uh, temperature and pressure and pH and other situation, um, in general, the rate of a chemical reaction depends on the concentrations of the uh, source uh, on the, the reactants. And so we probably expect that the rate of reaction is a function of the concentration of A and B. And that's a little bit cut off in the display here, and I apologize for that. I'll try to be more careful. If, we, if this is a consistent problem, I'll try to be more careful about making sure that we don't cut off the bottom of the slides. Um, but um, in principle, there could be also, but the only things that exist in our universe are A, B, and C. So the only things that our velocity can depend on in this model so far are A, B, the amount of A, the amount of B, and the amount of C. In general, the rate of reaction, a forward reaction doesn't depend on the amount of product. Okay. Now, if we have very low concentrations of molecules, we probably have to think about them as individuals. Um, and uh, later on in the class, we'll use Gillespie solvers, which actually solve this as if each molecular interaction were a single pair of molecules coming together. Uh, but typically we're gonna assume that there are enough of them that we can think of a concentration. Um, and we're also going to assume to begin with that the rate of reaction is deterministic. Um, and again, if we, if we have low rates of low concentrations, that's not going to be the case. Um, and in biology, the, these continuum assumptions are often not right. I mean, we have a one or two copies of a gene in the DNA. That's not a good approximation to continuum. Uh, we either have a transcription factor bound or not. Uh, so to assume that we have rates of reaction there is a little bit, uh, a little bit unrealistic. Surprising again that it works. Uh, we're also going to assume that we're not considering spatial variation. Uh, within a cell, the concentration of molecules varies a lot from place to place, and we're going to be neglecting that. We're going to sort of when we talk about molecules inside a cell basically going to assume that there's a scalar number, which is the concentration of that molecule inside of the cell. And that's a very harsh assumption. It's called the stirred reactor hypothesis. Okay. If we make those assumptions, uh, then we can do write what's called reaction kinetics, which is A plus B goes to C at a rate VF that depends on A and B, is a generic statement about physics. It doesn't tell us that the, the, the uh, doesn't tell us that we have a deterministic relationship. It doesn't tell us that we're treating, uh, concentrate, we're treating molecules as concentrations or other than individuals. Uh, but if we decide that they are, what we get are uh, differential equations, what are called rate equations. And rate equations always have the same form. 
which is that d by dt of some continuous variable, in this case, the concentration of the molecule, is equal to a rate. And so the left-hand side is the thing that's changing in time. It's always first order in time. And the right-hand side is a rate. And so our one little molecular reaction here, A plus B goes to C, turns into dA by dt equals something, dB by dt equals something, dC by dt equals something. And since we're using up one A and one B, that something is minus VF for A and B, and it's plus VF for C. And that's as far as we can go, unless we have some hypothesis about what that rate law is. How does the rate of reaction depend on the concentration of A and B? Now, there are uh, simple ways of thinking about this. Um, and, and, and I may skip some of the slides that go into the details here. There are a lot of different ways. The, the simplest chemical reaction law, which applies in, in uh, essentially is an upper bound on the rate of reaction, is called the law of mass action. And it's based on the observation that if you have no A, you better not have any reaction. So the rate of reaction better be zero if the VF of zero comma B better be zero because you can't make net, you cannot get negative amounts of A. And similarly, if you have no B, the amount, the rate of reaction should be zero. And we also expect that at least when we don't have a lot of A and B, the more A we have, the faster the reaction will be. And the more B we have, the faster the reaction will be. And with those hypotheses, mathematically, you can show that the simplest form you can write down, so the first element of the Taylor expansion, if you want that, is the law of mass action, that the rate of reaction is a constant, the rate constant, times the concentration of A times the concentration of B. Now, that rate constant could depend on lots of things that are external to this little diagram. It certainly depend on the temperature, depend on the pH, depend on the pressure, might depend on the magnetic field, might depend on the amount of light. Uh, but if those things are held constant, whatever they are, there'll be a value of K. And then we expect the rate of the reaction to depend on, to be linear in A and linear in B. Um, and now we can write actually rate equations, not just uh, which are dA by dt is minus K A times B, dB by dt is minus K A times B, dc by dt is k times a times b. So now, if we give the initial amounts of a, b, and c, and we typically say a sub of zero or a sub zero, we can calculate the amounts of a, b, and c or concentration of a, b, c at all times. And I realize that this is, is in a sense, very, very simple, but when we start doing this in large scale, it, it's not so simple. But conceptually, everything we're going to do is very simple. Um, there are a couple of things that we have to think about. One is that uh, concentrations and amounts are positive. So if they start bigger than or equal to zero, they better stay bigger than or equal to zero. Um, uh, in the particular case, if A and B make C and nothing else happens, then uh, no matter how we start out, amounts of A and B decrease continually in time, um, and the amount of C increases continually in time. Um, at the end, at very long times, um, if we started out with a lot of A and, if we started out with equal amounts of A and B, we'd have no A and B at the end. If we started out with more A than B, the reaction will proceed until all of our B is used up, so we'll wind up with no B at the end. Our final amount of A will be A0 minus B0. Our amount of C will be equal to A0 minus B0, or amount of B. 
And so now this is a, a mathematical form for this reaction. And I can write a sim computer simulation uh, to do that. And so now I don't know if everybody has, how many do people have computers with them? If you have a computer, it would be probably good to, to get your computer out. If you don't have a computer, then uh, we will um, look over somebody's shoulder for the moment. We've done all this. We've done all this abstract discussion. So now let's let's get on the computer, um, and we're going to define uh, the chemical reaction in in the antimony language, and then we'll simulate it using uh, tellurium, the package that implements antimony. Um, and we're going to find that all the simulations we're going to use will have two languages in them which is maybe a little bit inconvenient, but antimony is so simple, it's really not that bad. Um, one of which is going to be Python, uh, and one of which is going to be antimony, which is how we specify the network. So again, we're going to have a language called antimony, which is going to be used to specify chemical reactions or network models. And then we're going to execute them with Python scripts um, using a backend solver called LibRoadRunner. And that's implemented in something called Tellurium. Um, I'll do it on NanoHub probably, um, but you can also download Tellurium uh, to your um, local computer. One of the reasons that that we preferred uh, NanoHub was because people who are on Macs or Linux systems often found that uh, things didn't work that well uh, when they ran locally. And so uh, the advantage of NanoHub is it may be a little bit clunky, but everybody has the same experience. Uh, and there are no, no installer problems. So uh, if you haven't already done it, and I realize a lot of people have done this many times, uh, I would encourage you to create a NanoHub account. Uh, how many people, who, who does not, does anybody not have a computer who's here? Everybody has a computer, good. Um, has anybody downloaded Tellurium already? Oh, well, you you have. Okay, so so uh, you're welcome. You're welcome to, to to download it, but it takes a little bit of time to install and find it. So let's use NanoHub. So go so to get onto NanoHub, uh, go to uh, nanohub.org in your browser, and everybody here is at IU. In the summers when we teach this, we have people all over the world. So then getting into it, they have to use different uh, access methods. But you can sign in with an affiliated institution, type in Indiana University, and you should be able to uh, uh, just enter your uh, credentials and be able to get logged in. And again, if you've got if you've got now if you've got antimony running, Tellurium antimony running on, on your local desktop, Jupyter Notebook or Spider, that's fine. It'll just look a little bit different when we do the execution. The biggest difference is that, that depending on how you configure your local IDE, when you do things like plots, whether the plots are in separate windows or all overlay each other is different. And so that can sometimes be a little bit confusing. Okay, so we are going to now, uh, once you're in NanoHub, um, there are a number of ways to get Tellurium running. Um, you can type in directly nanohub.org slash tools slash Tellurium, or you can go to your, there'll be a desktop and you can search in the desktop for Tellurium. And let, give people a minute to try to try to get that open. And once you're there, if you hit launch tool, it will pop up uh, Jupyter Notebook. Right. So the issue with using the the, the issue the 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 the, the, the advantage of, of using NanoHub is that everybody has the same experience, and uh, you don't have to install anything on your local machine. It's it's platform independent. Uh, the disadvantage is that there are some limitations to what we can do on NanoHub. And 
things don't always get updated a lot. Uh, so you'll find that it's a relatively old version of Python. Um, and now there are more recent there are more recent versions of Jupyter Notebooks um, on uh, on uh, NanoHub, but uh, because NanoHub is a public server that can be used by anybody, they control what you can do. And so I can't have you go to a new Jupyter Notebook install and say, import Tellurium as star or import star from Tellurium. Uh, in their in their Jupyter notebook, it has to be pack the the the, the packages, uh, the libraries have to be packaged with the application. So we're sort of stuck on that. Again, if you're on your desktop, it's not it does not much. Okay. So did everybody get it to open? Yes. Amazing. I shouldn't be saying that, but but it is. It doesn't always work. I'll just say that. Okay. Um, the other thing you could do is there's a button called collect, uh, which will pin uh, Tellurium to your dashboard, uh, which is useful. And so you should have something that looks like that. And um, you can tell me if this is fixed or not. <clears throat> Does it say at the top uh, read only in your, in your version? It does. Okay, so that's a bug. So this is a bug that has not been fixed for years. Um, so um, we're going to, we'll, we'll, for some reason, when when this particular install launches, it launches in a read-only mode, and we're going to have to restart the kernel to uh, to get it to be writable. Uh, for today, if you're not saving things, it's, it doesn't matter. But it, but uh, it's. Uh, it's an, it going to be an issue. Uh, and then you're going to lose, when you do the restart of the kernel, you're going to lose the import to learn as TE. So you'll get, you have to get used to typing that uh, multiple times. Otherwise, it's okay. Again, the, the problem is the default, the default notebook is read only. And so you need to make a copy of it um, to save it. Uh, and that's only the case when you launch it the first time. So if you go uh, pull down your file menu and select make copy, that should uh, that should get rid of that uh, read only box. The other way to do it is to restart the kernel. Under kernel, you say, "Give me a new Python kernel." I will get rid of it. Again, for today, for today, it's not a problem. But but if you're doing if you write a lot of code and you discover you can't you can't save it, it's a pain. References. As I mentioned before, uh, and of course in a, in, a, in a classroom on a laptop, uh, it's, it's, it's a, you wind up having a thumb back and forth. I sent out to people um, some cheat sheets. Um, the whole syntax of, of Tellurium and Andamony fits on one page easily. And so I do encourage people to print out that one page cheat sheet that I sent. And if you're not a Python doc, uh, there was also a six page uh, Python cheat sheet that I found pretty useful. Um, I also encourage you to uh, open up Herbert's wonderful, wonderful uh, uh, tutorial, uh, tellurium.readthedocs.io and uh, have that open in, 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 a, in a tab in your browser. Uh, it really, it's really nice. That's a, it's a great. His, his examples are great, and they're executable, which is also nice. Okay, so uh, why don't we actually do that? Why don't people go to the? Um, we're run, we're, if we were a little less time, I would do this with you. But let's see. People seem to be okay on their own. So that mean I don't think I have to do it with you. Let's see whether it works. So go to that to go to that um, read the docs example, and the very first thing you'll see where it says quick start, select quick start, and there's a set of code here. Import to learning with te r equals te dot load a da 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 da. Select it. So 
and then copy it and then paste it into your Jupyter Notebook cell in, uh, in your uh, NanoHub. And Pedro and, and, and Elmer will not, and Ibrahim will notice that uh, cut and paste works in, in Jupyter Notebooks and NanoHub. Doesn't work in CompuCell, but it works in Jupyter Notebooks and NanoHub. Because uh, CompuCell uses X11 interface, which is predates cut and paste. It's just sort of scary. Uh, hard to believe, huh? That's a, a feature older than, older than not, almost everyone in this room. And people still use it, scary. Um, so cut and paste it into the Jupyter Notebook cell and then uh, shift enter to evaluate it, see what happens. Elmer asks a very good question, which is a logistical question, which is what should their project look like? So yes, the project should look like a Jupyter Notebook, which you will put up on NanoHub and you will distribute so that, that anybody Anybody and everybody, you can distribute. You say, here is the link to my project. And uh, again, uh, in your case, Elmer, you don't, you're, not, you're not looking for a job, but you know, especially undergraduates often, uh, you know, if you're applying to, to a company, you can say, run my code, see what I did with a one click, which is actually not bad. Uh, these days, if I were to set everything up again, I might use Colab instead of Jupyter Notebook. So it worked and you got a plot, huh? Did it work for everybody? Does anybody not have it work? No, what happened? No. Oh, it worked, okay. Okay, so we can now begin to go about over through what we've got here. Um, that particular example is a little bit um, simplified, uh, but typically we're going to have something that looks rather similar, except that the model definition is going to be expanded a bit. So um, what we are going to do is we're going to have always the line import to learn as TE, which loads the library that we're going to be running. Um, we're then going to say something like R equals TE dot load A, which loads a model. And then that model itself will be embodied in a string. And in this case, the string is actually in line inside of that uh, TE load A function, but more commonly we will say string equals model name, model, and then we'll load this load from the string. Okay, so we're gonna have a TE load A that loads the model. Um, and then we're going to have a, a line that says something like result equals R dot simulate, uh, start time, end time, how many steps, micro steps, that actually runs the model. And so we're always going to have uh, the model specification, which will be an antimony, and then uh, the execution of the model and its display, which will be done in Python. And uh, the number of Python commands we need to actually run uh, models is very few. The, the biggest uh, thing that we're going to have to do that's Pythonic is that um, r.simulate will return a NumPy array. And we will have to do some slicing and things to select columns and this kind of thing. Uh, and occasionally that can get a little bit elaborate, um, but it doesn't have to be, but it can. That, I would say I would say that the array manipulation is the most annoying thing that we have. Now, if we're going to do things like parameter identification or fitting, uh, then we might be using uh, SciPy or NumPy optimizers, for example, uh, or we'd be using matplotlib to plot things. And so we can use all of the power of uh, Python to do things, but we don't need a lot of it. So. Uh, depending on your 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 background in Python and, and Python libraries, uh, you have the freedom to 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 be as sophisticated as you want, but it's not required. Okay, so um, let's uh, now actually just implement that simulation. 
uh, we're going to write the, the chemical reaction A plus B goes to C at a rate K times A times B. And again, I will always try uh, to be careful to write my rate law on top of the arrow. And I'll get, there'll be some slides with caveats that people are not always careful about what they write. And so when you're reading the literature, you have to sometimes do some interpreting. Um, and so again, we're always going to have uh, the boilerplate code, which is just going to be loading uh, tellurium. And we'll define our model in antimony, and then we'll write uh, a line or two of Python code to solve and display the results. And the example that we already ran did that in a somewhat compressed form. And so here we're going to expand it out a little bit. You could use the code you already have, uh, or you could write it from scratch. Um, and so let's uh, let's actually just type it all together. So I'll have you type it and I'll look at you and see if it's finished. Uh, I, I often will use the split screen uh, where I'll have the, the tellurium antimony running on one side of the screen and uh, the slides on the other. But because these displays are not huge, if I do that, the, the character, the fonts get pretty small, so it gets harder to read. So if it's okay for today, at least I'll I'll just I won't I will let you do the coding and I'm not going to do it along with you. When it when, in the days when everything was online, I'd always do a split screen. Go ahead. Yes, please. Um, okay. So so good question. Uh, Herbert loves giving things new names. Uh, if you look at Herbert, he's a trail of names. Uh, and, and I personally disapprove of, of, of using common names as names of software because it, may, it often, actually these days it usually is not a problem. There was a period when you know, somebody would create a software package called Raccoon and you couldn't find it because all you found were raccoons. Uh, as it happens, if you type in Teluria but software, you'll pull up the right package because it's not that common name. So, so Antimony is a model specification language, uh, which is going to be the thing in red here in the in the display. Uh, Tellurium is a library that includes tools for loading and interpreting parsing antimony and for running computer simulations of antimony specified models. So Tellurium is a Python library. Uh, antimony is a standard for describing models. So the triple quotes in Python are uh, a Python convention that says I am going to define a string that has carriage returns in it. So normally, uh, normally in Python, uh, carriage return ends whatever you're defining. And so if you want to have line breaks inside of a string, you have to use triple quotes. And you could use uh, triple double quotes or triple single quotes, but whatever you do at the beginning and the end has to be the same. Uh, and, and actually, antimony doesn't require you to have line breaks. Uh, you could use semicolons uh, as, uh, as uh, delimiters, but um, we'll come to that in a minute. Uh, but it's certainly easier to read it if you have multiple lines. So the, the, the triple quotes are just because you have carriage returns inside of the string definition. Great question. Okay. So um, antimony is great. Uh, every, well, not every year, but often somebody will come in and say, well, I really would rather do everything in Mathematica. And Mathematica is unbelievably powerful. And it can do all sorts of things that are sort of a pain to do in antimony. Uh, it's also proprietary, so you have to pay for it. Antimony is open source and free. Uh, and, it, and the syntax of Mathematica is not trivial to learn. Uh, and the power also comes with a cost of, of complexity. And so there's a trade-off, which is that, that antimony is very, very simple. And, and uh, I may run out of time, but before I can teach you all of antimony syntax today, but if I had not lost my first 15 minutes to glitches to the video, I could teach you all of antimony syntax today, uh, which I could not do with Mathematica. Uh, so, so this is the trade-off. 
Um, really, antimony all fits on one page. Thinking about how to use it is a big deal, but, but the syntax is very, very simple. Okay, so the first thing you have to do is have that import to learning with PE line. And so make sure that you've got that. Um, and that's simply loading the library we're going to use to solve the antimony model. And if, if anybody needs more time, just say so. You, you should have it from the boilerplate code you paste. Okay, so the next thing we're going to do is normally I would say string equals triple quotes and then load the string, but for purposes of convenience, we'll just say inside of, we're going to put our string inside of the load function. You should already have from the code you pasted in R, equal, uh, R equals T load A. So type R equals T load A, open parenthesis, triple quotes. And then you can put a close parenthesis, triple quotes at the bottom and we'll type things inside. So te dot load a uh, parses the string that's passed to it into an executable form. Okay. Now I've called the model R. The model could have any handle we want. Well, modular. Don't 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 put spaces in in in, vari in handles or variable names. Don't in it, don't begin variable names with a special character or a number, uh, be, you know, be sensible about it. Um, it. It amazes me how often people want to have file names that begin with numbers or special characters. That works okay on a Windows system, but then somebody has a Mac or a Linux system, which croaks when you have those, those special characters in the name. So, so just, just stick with something simple. <laughs> Uh, okay. All right. And now we have actually antimony. And the core concept of antimony is something that's very, very natural. We've written the chemical reaction A plus B goes to C at a rate K times A times B. And we're going to type the name of the reaction. We don't have to name the reaction, but we're going to name it R1, reaction one, colon indicates that it's a name. And then we will type A plus B minus sign caret C. I mean, you couldn't have a more direct representation of the, of the chemical reaction than that. That's why I say the syntax is really simple. Um, and then we can't put the, the, we don't have a superscript. So we put a semicolon, which is the delimiter. And then we type K times A times B for the rate. So please, please type that. And that is that is 90% of antimony syntax is typing uh, a, 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 X plus Y goes to something else, semicolon rate law. That's it. Um, the nice thing about antimony is if we're actually doing chemical reactions, we could say 3A plus 7B goes to 2A plus 4B plus 6C, and it'll handle that. So I could write something that looks like a chemical reaction. That, that's something I can't do if I'm writing ODEs. For ODEs, I have to have dA by dt equals something, dB by dt equals something. Here I can have complex reactions and it's handled, all, all the bookkeeping is handled automatically. So please type just R1 colon A plus B goes to C, semicolon K times A times B. Okay. Now, to solve this, I need to give initial amounts or concentrations for A, B, and C. Here, I'm going to start out with 10 units of A, 10 units of B, and dot of C. So I'll type A equals 10.0, B equals 10.0, C equals 10.0. Unlike Python, um, antimony is pretty forgiving about integers and, and floats. So you could type if you say A equals 10, it's, it's, it's always going to treat concentrations as floats. You don't have to have the decimal point. Uh, I prefer to type it. And I also always, in, it's not in this example because it's an old slide. I always put the semicolons at the end of the lines but they're not needed. 
Well, a is a is just a number, so it's a it's a number. So a here is ten. We have a define. You can define units in antimony, but it's they're not really used. But it's up to us to say ten what? Ten millimolar, ten micromolar, ten moles, ten uh, ten molecules. Um, uh, basically, if if the if the rate constant k has units, then that has to be compatible with what we defined for the uh, units of, of a, b, and c. If I were going to be teaching this in a more formal way later on, I'd say you should always put the units in as a comment at the end of each line. Uh, but for the moment, we're just uh, we we have limited time. So today, I want to write, write a sum code and write run it. Now, if you give if you don't specify the initial values of of variables like a, b, and c, uh, antimony will set them to zero. However, for parameter like k, the rate constant, if you don't if you don't specify that, antimony will 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 croak. It will it will throw an error. So we'll say the rate constant is one to begin with. Okay. And then we have to actually run the simulation. We've loaded the simul. We've loaded this model. And this is a little bit different. I mean, of course, if you're used to a compiled language, you're the 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 this, this the models the 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 program specification of what's executed are separate. If you're used to an interpreter, then the the program is in a sense being executed. Uh, here, the there really is a two step process. There's a model specification. That model specification is parsed, and then that 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 parse result is executed. We don't actually execute the code that we're writing. That that's going to have consequences later on. And now we're going to simulate the we're going to simulate the simulation, uh, and that is using the r dot simulate command. Uh, r here is the name is the handle we gave the the loaded model. So. If I said if here where I said R, if I call that model, then it would be model.simulate, standardly Pythonic. And uh, simulate uh, takes typically requires two arguments, the initial time and the final time. And we have optionally, although I recommend it, uh, how many time steps to use within the simulation. Um, because the, the integrators in, in antimony aren't the most sophisticated in the world. Uh, if we make that, if we said simulate with one time step, the thing will will uh, will get a numerical divergence. Okay. So start time, end time, and number of points within the simulation. And that's going to return a NumPy array that has columns, which will be time, and then A versus time, and then B versus time, and then C versus time. So to run that, we hit shift, enter. Does everybody have that typed in? Does anybody need more time for that? I've been leaving it on the screen so that if you, if, if I'm, and then, uh, well, nothing happens because I haven't displayed it. So uh, let's actually look at what was returned. So if you type in uh, a cell and hit res type result in, in Jupyter Notebooks, it'll print, uh, the the object that you just defined. So if you print result, you'll see the array, and it's a it's a four column array, and uh, the NumPy arrays will actually have a label. They're labeled, so it has the the alphabetic time at the top for the first column A, B, and C for the other columns. And that'll let me do things like I can I can reference uh, a column uh, alphanumerically. I can ask for column A or column time from the array. So if I'm doing slicing, I can do it that way. Okay. So the question is, what does the time represent? And that's a very good point. Um, at the moment, the time is just a number. Um, just the way our our values of A, B, and C don't represent moles or molecules or anything else they're just numbers here we've basically solved an ordinary differential equation and when we set k equal to one we're specifying uh, how fast the reaction occurs in units of nothing in units of one 
Um, uh, typically, if we want to interpret something that's meaningful in the real world, we will say that one unit of time in, in antimony represents one second, one minute, one hour, one day. But when we do that, when we define a day, we will often then have to say that K is the one times X per day or X per minute. So we'll have to do some conversion factors. So yes, at the moment, time is an abstract quantity, which is just a number. So we're, we're not, we're treating this just as an ordinary differential equation, uh, which says that dA by dt equals minus one times A times B. And so that time in that, in time in that is just a variable. It doesn't have, it doesn't have that. But that's a very good question. And, and antimony does allow you to define the units and then display the units. So if you want to get like uh, really divide by a thousand, you can put a thousand one. If we did the time, the time kept like uh, 0 0.101. Well, it should it should have zero plus ninety nine col nine hundred ninety nine columns. So it should be a thousand rows. Are you telling me there are 999 rows in this array? Yes. So what the last one is what? Um, 40 minus what? So you, no, it depends in ten, but it should give you a it should give you a thousand rows. Probably not. I, I, I don't have, I don't know how to count. Okay, you can look that up. There's a function that tells you the, the shape. Yeah. Len would work too. Uh, I often, I often learn Python tricks from the students. There are a lot of. So the point was being made by Pedro was that. It is, it is not but to get the proper interval between time sets, I had to put 1001. Pedro makes the point that, that you have to be a little bit careful about when you iterate in Python, you stop before the last element of the iterator. And so, and Python uses zero basis. And so, if you say run for a thousand time steps, there's a question of, is it really a thousand lines of output or is it 999 or a thousand and one? And what is the time step? Is it divided by a thousand? Is it divided by a thousand and one? And I, we can definitely come back, we can definitely come back and, and, and investigate that uh, going forward. Um, the last thing that I want to do today, though, is just is just uh, display the output. Um, usually, if you want to do anything nice, we will use uh, matplotlib to plot. Um, but there are a couple of built-in uh, plot functions. In particular, if I type r dot plot, that will give me a default plot. Um, and so people should try typing r dot plot and see what they get. Now, if you're running, uh, you have some choices about the settings of your IDE, uh, whether the plot pops out, whether it overlays automatically, or whether it gives you a new plot, these kinds of things. Those are settings in the, in the IDE. Now, this reaction that we, so if I come back to this reaction here, what you'll see is that it happened pretty fast. And here, sorry, I just, I changed, I changed something. Here I said simulate from zero to 40, okay? Um, with 10,000, with 1,000 steps. Here I've said to simulate from zero to 40 in 10 steps. And why don't people try that? So we get the plot to work. And then instead of having to simulate zero to, zero to 40 in 1,000 steps, do 10. And what you'll see is everything is over by the second step. 
So try that, see if that works. So this is what I was saying about you have to you have to adjust the the granularity of the simulation a little bit uh, when you run it. Again, this was the idea here was to do things quickly. We'll come back and dig dig into each of these things in a lot more detail going forward. Well, if I only have ten substeps, if I say zero comma forty comma ten, oh, oh. each. My first step is zero. My second will be four. My third one will be will be eight, and the reaction only takes ten time ten time units. So so basically, my granularity is that everything's done by the time I get to my second point. Um, if I do a hundred sub steps instead of ten, then it'll smooth things out. And of course, simulating to 40 doesn't really make sense because I'm getting a lot of zero. So let's try change it from simulating from zero to 40 to zero to 10, and then stretch that x axis out. Right, because I start out with equal amounts of A and B. Great point. So why don't you start out with A equals five and B equals 10? See what happens. I mean, the, the purpose of this exercise, and we're, we're, we're almost out of time, so is, is that it's an extremely simple chemical reaction, but it does take a little bit of play to get it to display right, to do the calculation in a way that's meaningful. We have to say how many, you know, how long is, should the simulation last? Well, if we run from zero to 100, that's too long. Zero to 10 shows us what was in, significant in this case. How many substeps do we need? Well, 10 isn't enough. 10,000 is way too many. It's just wasting computer time. Won't, won't cause a problem, right? It, if, you, if you make it too, too long, uh, Tellurium will crash because of the way the solvers work. You type, type a million substeps, I think, I think you'll find Python will crash on it. You can simulate a million substeps, but you have to do it in, in batches. You can't do it all at once. Um, and so, so the goal here is just, and as you point out, uh, uh, if you start out with equal amounts of A and B, they overlay each other. And in this simple plot, you don't see, you don't see A because it's completely covered over by the line for B. So, so one can one can already with this very simple example play with with not. Nah, not much, but a little bit. How do you display it properly? How do you set the parameters to be? How do you set the, the integrator to be reasonable? Um, so a very simple question. So we could change the value of K and see what happens. If K is bigger, things happen faster. If K is smaller, things slow down. Um, clearly, uh, we're gonna have to, if, if K is very large, we simulate for a shorter amount of time, right? The final time will be shorter that we want. If K is very small, we may want to stretch out that final time. And so we can play with these things. Um, and this was the last thing that I was going to do was exactly this, try changing the value of A, the initial value of A. Um, instead of making A 10, make initial, I here I said zero, but try making initial value of A five. So if you make it zero, well, if you tried zero first. If, zero, if it's zero, what happens? Nothing happens. Because remember, the rate of reaction is A times B. If we have no A, there's no reaction. So nothing happens. Now, if we get just the amount of A, try five, but you can play with this. It only takes a second. You can see for a fixed amount of B, depending on who ha which I have more of, I get a different final state. If I make A and B equal to each other, all A and B are used up and I get maximum amount of C. If I have only a little bit of A, then I can only make that much B, I mean that much C. If I have a lot of A, at the end I have A left over, use up all of my B. So really that's, that's uh, I'll let you play with that a little bit. Uh, we won't do the next exercise, but the next exercise would be to say, okay, we know how to write one chemical reaction, let's make two. 
Well, it's pretty easy to do. You just add another line, R2 colon uh, B plus C goes to D. The one thing that, the only thing that you have to remember in antimony is that if you name something, the names have to be unique. So if I name reaction one, A plus B goes to C is reaction one. And then I say R1 colon B plus C goes to D. The parser will ignore the first one. It will just do the last one. So you have to give, if you name things, you have to give the names, make the names unique. So the variables like, say, if I use R1, I take a C, it's a C. Yeah. R2, you can like C plus C. Any of that's allowed, yes, because they're chemical reactions. The species is the species. That's the great thing, because if I have if I if I have a reaction A plus B goes to C, it solves it. If I now say, by the way, A also goes to D, it will solve that too, and it'll combine them properly. If I say C goes turns back into A and B, that will be another line. It'll solve that properly. And so just the way if I write a chemical reactions, a list of chemical reactions, uh, those things do what they do together. If I write them in antimony, they will do what they do together. Um, if I write ODEs, I have to continually be readjusting the terms within the ODEs. Here, uh, antimony handles all that for me. And that really is very convenient. And so, uh, again, here I'm not going to. We don't have time to do the example. We're over time. But if I have a simple reaction like A goes to B, B goes to C, C goes to D, I'll see the time variation of these, and I can then play, begin to play with the rate constants. And so that was really what I wanted to leave you with. That's a, a sim that's will be a little homework problem, uh, but it's really no more complicated than that. The last example was you have A go to B go to C. All of the A eventually becomes C. I wind up with no A, no B, only C. Here, I have D go back to A. This is what you were asking about. And now I have a closed loop reaction. And if I solve that, I'll get a chemical equilibrium. And so I can explore chemical reactions, not, not in a terribly sophisticated way, but in a very simple way. And it really is, it's nice because it only takes, what, five? You learn the syntax in what, 20 minutes? It really is simple. There are a couple of additional rules that we're going to learn. Uh, and we'll certainly learn uh, more complicated things outside of antimony in terms of optimizers and things like this. But fundamentally, we can write very, very complex networks now just with the, what you learned in, in, in 20 minutes. And so to me, the, the, the great beauty of, of antimony and tellurium is this real simplicity of our ability to write uh, uh, very potentially very complex models in a very, very simple way. There, there are lots of other systems for writing these things that are more elaborate. Um, and we will run into situations where there are things that we'd like to express that are hard to express. But we can get a long way without without needing much more than this. So here, A goes to B. The rate is K sub A times A. So that it's just a convention that that um, low rate rate constants are usually lowercase k's. And since there are a lot of them, you want to have the a name for them that is tells you what they reference. So write K sub A B if it's the rate of that A goes to B or you write K forward or K backward. Um, and then we'll discover that later on when we go to more complex rate laws, you will see a lot of capital Ks. And so, uh, yeah, there, there's, uh, and the other thing that you'll find is that, that when you write a chemical reaction, um, the, the convention for, for a complex, uh, if A and B don't, don't chemically react, but do, bind to each other, which happens a lot in biology, um, you'll have you'll write the complex as a b. But that looks like a times b. And so sometimes you use brackets to indicate concentrations. You put square brackets around the letter 
to 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 basically uh, we'll we'll come to that next it's it's not difficult but there's there's some there's just some 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 no ambiguity about the way that about the way you write uh uh chemical complexes uh, uh, but uh, it doesn't affect antimony. It's just a question of how I display it on the screen so that you can interpret what's being written. Um, just the way I write K times A, but in antimony, you need a star for multiplication. You'll notice that for chemical reactions, if I have three molecules of A plus two of B going to C, I don't put a star. So when it's parsing the arrow diagram, you write three A with no with no times um, to try to respect what you do in in the in the chemical reaction from right? So I have three three, three two oxygen two two hydrogen plus oxygen goes to water. I don't write two times oxygen two times hydrogen. I just write two H. So it, it follows that the chemical thing. Or, OD is ordinary differential equation. So dA by dt equals something. Simply saying that A, A changes continuously in time at a rate that's given by the right-hand side. 